So like this is okay? Okay. Okay. So, so thank you for the invitation. Very happy to be here with you and uh, some most part of the organizers are very nice friends. So um, I, will, I will speak about the work that was uh, was uh, done in, in published in two was done in 2019 and published uh, last year, but I think is still very, very updated. So uh, this is a joint work with Professor Elmut Maurer that is retired but is still active. He's from Germany, and I want to thank you, the organizers, for the invitation. So this is the more important slide of the talk. Next. So the motivation uh, of this talk is to, um, to consider uh, the treatment for HIV. And we know that uh, HIV infection uh, is still a very uh, dramatic problem. Although COVID-19 is now the main concern, HIV, the other disease remain uh, very important to, to deal and to try to eliminate it and to eradicate. Um, so um, the, the more important uh, uh, medical advance in the treatment of HIV was uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the production or the, the, when uh, the, the researchers found uh, some drugs that can, um, in, uh, that can uh, inhib inhib in, how to say, suppress inhib the, inhib the HIV replication uh, unto the undetectable levels in an individual body. But these undetectable levels, they don't mean that the HIV virus is completely eliminated. They, they remain in some places that are called reservoirs, and that is why HIV is a, is a disease that up to now doesn't have cure. But with these uh, drugs, with these medicines, uh, an individual can live uh, almost as long as an healthy individual if they take the medicines every day. So these drugs are very effective and are very, and even they are very effective to prevent. They can be used as a preventive measure. And, but, uh, oh, and that's why, for example, we have in, we have in 2020, 37.6 million li people living with HIV infection, but only, this is a lot of people, but is a very little percentage of the individuals that were, that are currently infected and the ones that died. Uh, but what is the main problem or main, these drugs have, have side effects and they have to be taken every day. So the, the people must have a, a very strong adherence and this is very hard from uh, uh, every, every aspect. So what was, was our idea? Was to try to, using mathematical models, to try to, 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 to find out what would be the best uh, optimal strategy to uh, combine the uh, drugs, uh, antiretroviral the drugs, the classical, and with immunotherapy for HIV infection. This has been studied for uh, some years. And for example, here in this paper, uh, they, they are studying the effect of immunotherapy in, in HIV. And the goal is, uh, we can speak to two to main goals. Uh, the one is to try to, to see if the, uh, to, we can, instead of taking drugs every day, the antiretroviral every day, maybe with this immunotherapy, the patients could do some poses. Uh, so to eliminate the need of taking the medicine every day. And the more important, is to try to, 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 to eliminate these latent reservoirs. And this would be the, a great, of great importance. So uh, this is really, uh, as I said, updated because uh, we have here, uh, this, this here news about uh, speaking about the importance or the, what the immunotherapy can bring to, to patients with HIV. So how we will do it? from a mathematical point of view. So we want to introduce in a, in a, in a model these two strategies and try to configure in using optimal control theory, try to figure what will be the optimal st treatment scheme uh, for patients with, H that, uh, with HIV. So that combining the classical treatment with immunotherapy. 
So first of all, we must uh, consider a model that uh, uh, describes the dynamics of, the, of uh, uh, when uh, we, an individual gets the, is infected by the HIV virus and how this affects the cells in the human body. So we choose a model that has been studied for many years. Uh, there are others. Some, we can say that mathematically they are very similar. It's, uh, we can work with one or another. The, the way to do it is mathematically speaking is the same. And they are, some of them, they are quite similar. So we choose this one that is simple, only three equations. And it, the, the, this uh, we have here, each of the equation describes the, the, the dynamics of the number of uh, uninfected CD40 cells in the human body, infected CD40 cells, and here the CTL if, um, cytotoxic T lymphocytes that are the cells that, rep that uh, represent, uh, roughly speaking, the immune system. We don't have here the viral load because we assume that the viral load is proportional to the level of infected cells. So instead of having four uh, equations, we have only three. Uh, so this is the model that has, is studied and uh, they, they prove that the model uh, mo uh, is good to, to describe the, HIV, the dynamics of, uh, of HIV in a human body. And what we first did was in order to try to, 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 to have a more realistic model, we introduced time delay in the, the, this first model. To in order why we introduce time delay because we want to 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 that our model considers the incubation period that is the time between the new infection of a CD40 cell and the time it becomes infectious. So here we have this time delay that is a discrete uh, and represents this time that this period of time of this incubation period. Uh, after uh, we introduce one control that is so with this model we have, uh, uh, we, we can have real data and we can say that this model fits real data. Okay. And with the delay, we say that, okay, this model fits even better, uh, a little bit better real data because we have here the incubation period. But what we want to do is now we want to, to change these dynamics of the, of the cells. We want that the infected cells, uh, instead of increasing and then with the drug, decreases, we want them to decrease more fast or uh, even better so that don't, they don't uh, decrease so much, increase so much. We want to control the dynamics. So that's why we will introduce one control. That is the HIV uh, antiretroviral treatment, the classical treatment. And moreover, we introduce one time delay that, so this, uh, this uh, control U represents the drug therapy. Uh, and uh, moreover, we introduce one time delay, this, another time delay, this C1, that represents the pharmacological delay. We know that one, when we will take uh, some uh, medicine, it takes some time that our body starts to react. And uh, so that we, it requires time to, for the drug absorption, distribution and penetration in the target cells. So uh, once again, we want that our model is more realistic. Again, and uh, moreover, what we will do next, we will introduce another control that represents the immunotherapy. So here we have the, we have first the delay that is the incubation period. Here we have the, this control that will affect. So in this term here, we have that the uninfected, the infected cells infected, the infected cells and they are uh, they come to, the, there is a, here an increase of the infected cells that is proportional to the number of infected cells and not in, in, uninfected. So what this control will do here, when the control is one, we have no infection. But if the control is zero, we have the previous, uh, with the, the model without uh, drugs therapy. And here, the ESO is the pharmacological delay. So what we will do here is like we give an injection of uh, antibodies so that they will increase the number of uh, um, the cells uh, alive that, uh, representing the immune system. So here, so this is immunotherapy. But again, we will introduce one delay in this control that also represents the time that the immune, the, the immune system takes time to respond. So 
here is the delay uh, associated with the, with this uh, response of the, the immune system. So now we have to write our optimal control problem with uh, state and control delay state because the these are the state variables so and we have delays in the x and the y and control delays because each of the controls has one delay that represents what I, what I said. So this is our control system that we want to, that the solutions of this system, they are such that they minimize this control function. And what we want to maximize, sorry, what we want to maximize, we want to maximize the uninfected cells, cells that are not infected and the immune system but with the, the least um, drugs possible, the least medicine and uh, you, antibodies of, uh, possible. So we need to, to, to describe the initial conditions to solve the, the control system and the controls, they are bounded. They are bounded between zero and the maximum value that is not the same for the U1 and the U2. And then we have to, we need to have the, to, in order to, I will just show some numerical simulations because uh, we solve it, uh, the problem all analytically and we show that this, the analytical solutions are quite interesting. But in order to be shorter, I will just show the, the numerical solutions and try to, to explain uh, the, how they are interesting from a practical point of view. But all of this, we solve it analytically. So, as I said, the controls, they are bounded. So, uh, the, when the control, the, the antiretroviral drugs, uh, they are bounded between zero and one, it means take uh, uh, full doses or don't take, but the immune system, they, the, the bound is much, the, for the antibodies is much smaller because we need to pay, uh, pay, uh, pay attention um, in order that the, the, human, the immune system does not have an overreaction that is even worse than to be uh, protected. Uh, and, so the, and also here the delays that we consider for the um, incubation period, pharmacological delay, immunotherapy delay, that are based on, uh, on scientific papers uh, in this field. So first we solve the problem without delays. And uh, here are the, the solutions. So uh, we have that the, um, these are un, un, the uninfected T cells. So we, this is good. It's good to have uh, a lot, uh, this, this number of not infected T cells. And here the, the Y are the, the viral load or the infected because they are proportional. And here the Z in the immune system. So uh, with the immune system is always uh, active and the, we see an, a decrease of the infected cells. So usually what happens when, we, when the virus comes is that we have uh, an increase and then we take the drugs and then the, 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 we see like uh, for the active curves in infected people now with COVID increase and then decrease. Here we see that they, they, there is no increase. They, uh, they immediately start decreasing. And what we have here is the controls U1 and U2. So here we say that we take full doses of the drugs and then we can have here like a pose of the, it's not a pose, but there is a reduction of the, the treatment with the antiretroviral drugs and then it goes to, to zero. But uh, the control of the immunotherapy, it takes its maximum value for almost all the time. So it means that, so only with the, this uh, only with this immunotherapy only almost constant we can have here a reduction of the anti antiretroviral drugs uh, when we introduce delays what happens uh, so the the solutions are not that different but what is different is here the the solution of the optimal control and from a medical point of view uh, we can say that this is more easy to implement because here we have, we have uh, here, we can see that. So what we say here is that you say, you take full doses and then you decrease. But from a medical point of view, it's difficult to say, okay, uh, here I take 0 0.2, tomorrow 0 0.3, here, then 0 0.4. So it's difficult, uh, here zero. But here it's uh, an optimal control, we say bang, bang. So it says we have, it's uh, full doses, then you stop, and then full doses, then you stop. So it's more easy. And also it, it is interesting that here we have, from a mathematical point of view, we have a singular arc 
and here we only have bang bang solutions. So when we introduce delay, the solution of the, the optimal control problem is really different and, the, and the, its properties are different. So, and this is also interesting from a mathematical point of view. The control U2, uh, it's quite similar. And when we introduce delay, we can, although we introduce delay, if the solution says that we can finish the immunotherapy a little bit earlier. Uh, and so what I, in the title, I also add uh, uh, that the optimal control with pure state inequality. So as I only have one minute, I will just explain what is this. We can introduce in the optimal control theory for problem, a constraint that ensures us that the immune system um, is never, uh, is always, the, the cells that, that are associated with the human system are always below a, a maximum value. And this is to ensure a functional behavior of the immune system. Like I said, to don't have an overreaction of the immune system. And this is quite important uh, from a medical point of view. And here are the solutions. And what we have is that here for the immune system, we have, we, we, we put, uh, we consider this constraint. And we have here that the solution, this constraint is satisfied. And we have always this, uh, this um, ensured that the CTL cells are always below this value. So the, the optimal control solutions are quite similar for the control U1, but again for the control U2, so it's finished. <laughs> so for the control U2, the control is, is different. And this is also from a mathematical point of view, very interesting to see that we have here uh, this uh, singular arc instead of only bang, bang. And um, I think it's all. So we could, we could uh, study this better, but uh, I think I said, so this is difference between the controls. And I want to thank you, Professor Amut Maurer, and you all. Thank you. Thank you uh, for five minutes for uh, guest questions or comments. Paula. Uh, the song. Thank you. Thank you, Christiana, okay. for your in inspired and interesting presentation showing that the importance of uh, the applications of mathematics in the health problems. Um, uh, let me ask you um, if you are collaborating already with uh, some HIV virologists or uh, HIV medical departments in hospitals. Uh, no. This is a this is a future target that you you have, or are you planning to to work together? And uh, because this uh, seems to be so interesting in the, and helpful in. The, yes, I must be honest. So uh, no, we don't have. And um, as we so we have all when we are doing this rich research in mathematics, we have. To, I have to, to have two things in, in account. So first, that the application is interesting, but so also that we, I can do something interesting from optimal control point of view. Mm -hmm. So this was, we tried to get an application, but also that the solutions were interesting more from the optimal control problem. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, no, we don't have any, any contact. So no, yeah, we, very it's, nice. it's a suggestion. It's yes, a suggestion. yes. And the, and the, this this method, methodology will be. Um, uh, uh, are you using it also in another diseases? Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Because it can be applied to many others. Yes, many you others. You no, already, said, yes. yes, and as I said, the, the, when we look at the models from a mathematical point of view, they are similar. We, yeah. you, you, and you, you can uh, apply it to other many other fields. Uh, you just need to, to be sure that the, the modeling is well done and, uh, and, when, when, and the, it really translates what you want to say. So mm -hmm. that is very, very important that you have really, uh, so some doctors or virologists that uh, mm -hmm. tell you that it, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Because you can be studying a problem that does not make sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations once again and thank you for joining us. <laughs> okay, thank you again, Christiana. Um, Anna, can you continue? Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> I will, will say something. Uh, Professor Christiana will present uh, another application, I believe, uh, the 21 of July uh, at the math department. It's online event, so everyone is welcome to, 
to uh, to attend um, and um, I think we can start. I will. It's an honor to present my colleague and friend, Professor Wei Diana Lee. She's an associate professor at the Center of Engineering and Exact Science, and also general coordinator of the LABI Bioinformatic Laboratory at the Unio West, Western Paraná State University in Brazil. She holds a PhD in computer science from USP. Uh, University of São Paulo and the postdoctorate from the Faculty of Medical Science at Unicamp, University of Campinas. She works in the graduate programs of electrical engineering uh, and computer science at Unio West and in surgery science at Uni Unicamp. Her research interests include computing applied to health, data mining, telemedicine and bioinformatics it's your time, Professor Wei. Nice to have you thank, here. Thank you, Anna. I thank the uh, ANSPN committee for the invitation. It's an honor. I would like to start apologizing because I tested at 5 a.m. our time here. <laughs> the internet and all was okay. So when I tried to answer, the problems started. So, but it's okay now. Uh, thank you, and I will share my presentation here. Um, just let me know if it's okay. Can you see it? Not yet. It's starting, but uh, you say that, that uh, you start uh, sharing, but uh, not, not seeing yet. I believe the, they can help us, the, the technical uh, support. It says your, sh your screen sharing is paused. Um, resume share, let me see. It's, no, 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 it it's okay now, no. Okay, perfect. Oh, okay, but let me see, it's okay. So, thanks again. Um, so, I'm, I will be talking about our lab and some research. And I would like to start talking about the term translational research, uh, which has been most commonly referred to in life science, but may be applied to all science and humanity areas. It can be understood in general terms as to translate findings in fundamental research into practice. Following this motto, the Laboratory of Bioinformatics Lab uh, from the Western Paraná State University, Unio Este, in Brazil, in partnership with Brazilian and Portuguese institutions, computer science and engineering to support the resolution of health problems. So in this talk, some of these projects ranging from telemedicine, image analysis, machine learning, and biomechanics will be shared showing the beneficial cooperation between the exact science and the health sciences. Uh, it was 1970 when Janst proposed what became known afterward as the Janst model. So he showed us the various uh, multi-level, various levels of cooperation and it starts talking about the multidisciplinarity which is viewed as one level system of multiple objectives with no cooperation. Then we have interdisciplinarity. For its turn, it's a two level system of multiple ob objectives with coordination by higher level concept. And finally, we have the transdisciplinarity in a multi-level system of a multiple objectives with a coordination focusing on a common purpose of the systems. Or we can say also that it's a multi-level coordination of entire education innovation system uh, ranging all the levels uh, that are involved. So the translational research acts at the transdisciplinarity level it was only at the last two decades that translational research has reached more uh, concisely all areas. So before I talk about our projects, I would like to say where and who we are. Our lab is located at the Southern Brazil in the beautiful city of Foz do Iguaçu. 
which is well known for the Iguazu Falls. Um, this time I would like to share also some marvelous pictures that were taken by uh, the photographer Victor Lima, who is passionate about astrophotography. And he captured these rare sky scenes at Foz, uh, Iguazu Falls using the long exposure technique. Um, so this is what was the first time that these kind of pictures were taken here. So I wanted to share uh, with you and also leave a um, uh, uh, welcome to you when you, you, you can visit us. Uh, our lab is located in another well-known Brazilian institution in Foz do Iguaçu, the Itaipu National Hydroelectric where the Itaipu Technological Park is hosted. So we have the pleasure to receive Anna Mendes here. Hope you can visit us also uh, when the pandemic uh, give us the chance. Um, as mentioned, the transdisciplinary characteristic requires the cooperation of researchers from multiple areas. Since its foundation, LABI has always had its vocation based on two main areas, health and exact science, specifically computing and engineering, uh, bringing together projects and partners for many places uh, around the world. In Portugal, we, have, uh, we are very proud and happy to be collaborating with the Polytechnic uh, Institute of Lydia. LABI was one of the pioneer groups in Brazil with this transdisciplinary characteristic and translational focus. So it was pointed in the map of sites of the International Society for Computational Biology as a preeminent laboratory in the area. We, uh, we are interested, our group works in three major areas of expertise the intelligent data analysis, telemedicine, and biomechanics. So the technological availability has allowed for the rapid accumulation of large volumes of data. Thus, there is a gap between the generation of this data and their analysis, which can be done using methods for intelligent data analysis through process such as data mining. In our group, we have worked with data mining on various projects in a joint work between specialists in the fields of computing and health. Some examples include digestive system diseases like Crohn, peptic diseases and cancer, anorectal manometry, semen processing and ovarian hyperstimulation, clinical genome and concrete biodeterioration. One of the diseases with the greatest incidence in the world population is cancer. According to the US Cancer Institute, the four cancers with highest incidence among all malignant tumors are colorectal cancer, breast cancer, lung and bronchus cancer, and prostate cancer. So image analysis is a well-known topic that has gained pro prominence in recent times. Lab has worked on a variety of topics in this area, including colorectal cancer and melanoma, the latter being the subject of joint research with IPL involving the extraction of features and construction of models. However, intelligent data analysis can not be performed if data sources are not available and reliable. Thus, one of the areas of support and interest is also the development of computer web systems so that all collected data can be integrated. This allows clinicians to secure the access data and change it any time of the day and from anywhere. Thus, for example, for the topic of colorectal cancer, correlating colorectal image data to cancer coloproctal data, which involve information such as dietary, rabbits, uh, family history, can contribute to the development of new drugs, 
treatment and early identification of the disease. And uh, another area that we are interested is biomechanics. The idea is to apply mechanical engineering concepts to biological problems. We are basic, uh, basically interested in two themes in this area, analysis of the behavior of viscoelastic materials. Many materials in our daily lives are present, uh, present this property and analysis of movement of body parts. For example, in this project, we are concerned with monitoring and analyzing patterns of movement of various parts of the body. In this team, uh, we can act in patient rehabilitation, monitoring of high performance athletes, among others. And finally, uh, the third topic of interest is telemedicine. In these photos, it's possible to see one of the systems developed that allow real-time and remote interaction between physically distant participants through various audiovisual resources. In this project, the aim is not only to provide support for remote diagnosis, but also for continuing education. Um, uh, this figure represents the integration and cooperation of different teams and disciplines working with a great variety of types uh, of data resulting in different methods and tools that allow us to bring solutions to the end users towards transdisciplinarity. And finally, I would like to thank again for the invitation and the opportunity to share about LOBBY, some of its projects and our vision of transdisciplinarity showing this image so well known to all the Archimedes lever. In Lab's view, the beneficial cooperation between the exact science and health areas is the Archimedes virtual level lever. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Wei. Um, I will ask for some questions. We have, uh, I, uh, this is our first time here and uh, um, Professor Teresa, uh, told us that she couldn't um, ask for questions and technical support um, told us that uh, if you want to ask for some questions you have to pick the question and answers uh, at the uh, bottom of our page you everyone can access that and um, ask uh, because only the participants uh, uh, this, is, this is like a backstage, <laughs> so it's difficult to communicate from, with the participants that are outside this backstage. So, um, anyone? Mm. Uh, a question here, okay. Ah, uh, Professor uh, Teresa is saying that she is asking, but she can't. Uh, but, but she can't talk. Uh, I believe uh, uh, that it's not possible <laughs> to talk. It's it's a, a written um, question, but I'm not so sure um, because they do, didn't explain well this part to us. Um, so, if you don't mind, can you write? As we wait, Professor Wei give us an idea what LABI does and um, how it works. Uh, it was a different talk, I think, because it's not so I technical. Didn't, yes, I didn't share the details Techn of the methods um, when I received the invitation we thought that it would be interesting to, to show some applications. Um, as we can see, 
that's all mathematics. We always say to the students since undergraduation that uh, all is about mathematics. And it's not until they, sh they reach the last years that they really see that, oh, it's really, really, really important. Um, so I know the public here is not for students, but um, so we can see the range of applications that uh, we have. There, there are so many. Thank you, Wei. Um, since there is no uh, questions, uh, Professor, maybe we have time to that Professor Teresa ask the question. She has a question for Christiana. She did. She said that she really enjoyed your talk, and uh, if you don't mind, can you write it? Write it. Or maybe at the end, I don't know. What do you think, the, my colleagues, Paula? Should we have it? No, uh, yeah, Tre Professor Teresa, oh, Teresa, can you please write the question here? Uh, if you write it now, we can, we are, uh, Christiana will be able to answer. If not, we need, need to move to another speaker. Or, Christiana, I suggest you 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 leave your uh, email on the on the chat, and then the, the our colleague can contact you later. Okay. I also put will uh, announce here the seminars mm -hmm. the, that I was talking about previously, and so Paula, go ahead. Yes. Okay, um, thank you um, once again all of you for attending this session. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, João Menezes. Uh, João has a, a master degree in biomedical engineering from the University of Coimbra in Portugal <clears throat> with a specialization in instrumentation and biomaterials. He had worked and collaborated with scientific departments and uh, several companies in projects related to ophthalmology, optometry areas. Um, he's working in a FCT project called entitled Stimuli to Bioscaffolds, Stimuli modeling for bioscaffolds from uh, numerical modeling to in vitro tests, focused on uh, numerical model applications for tissue engineering problems. Uh, he participated actively in the development of a new generation of an optimized bioreactor patent that will revolutionary, uh, revolutionize uh, tissue uh, regeneration. Thank you, Joel, for accepting our invitation and um, uh, for sharing our, your work with us. Thank you. Okay, it's, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, are you seeing my screen and listening to my voice? Is everything okay? No, Joel, you, you are, we are seeing, it. maybe you can pass to the presentation mode, yes? Okay, now it's okay? Okay. It's okay, started. thank you. Thank so you. I will start. Okay. So I will shortly talk to you a little bit about uh, how we go to numerical models to bioreactor design in tissue engineering, uh, myself and my team. So just uh, giving you the context, the context idea. So I will start with a small introduction and then go to... Uh, show you our bioreactor proposal, then talk to you a little bit about how we go to numerical models to to what we are trying to predict, then so uh, bottom-up approach and future vision and finally the acknowledge. So starting with the problem. Uh, today the the bone fractures in the UA and in the European Union are estimated to increase, this is uh, estimated from six countries only, but uh, are increasing 23%. Uh, and uh, in the future, the European age quake is not reaching its highest magnitude, so the, the, count, the people are getting older and older, and uh, we are increasing our median age from uh, 37 years to 52 years. So uh, this uh, bone fracture will greatly increase, not just uh, in costs for society, but also in quality adjusted life years, uh, years that people can be working, being productive, and they will be not due to fracture. So this is a great problem uh, that we must uh, solve it. 
Uh, and right now, uh, what we what we can it's uh, that bone fractions that occur after trauma infection or oncologic resection, uh, small bones uh, fractures can be solved uh, quite easily. You just have to rest, and if they are shorter than uh, 2.5 centimeters, they will uh, just heal by themselves. But if you have a critical size defect, which is a gap uh, higher than 2.5 centimeters you will require secondary procedures to obtain union and healing. And this is the cause for most of the cost and, and the years, years lost that I have spoken before. Uh, so in a common practice in healthcare, uh, you have uh, these four kinds of uh, operational, uh, operation is solvers, like autologous grafting, uh, induced membrane technique, also bone transport through distraction osteogenesis and prevascular bone transfer. Uh, these are all kinds of, uh, of works where the, the donor gives, a, you just remove a part of the bone from the hip, for example, and then translate to the local, to the place where you have the bone defect. Um, but right now, the, the approach uh, should be this new kind, a tissue engineering approach. Uh, what will be this tissue engineering approach? Uh, it will be like, uh, what I'm showing you here on this cycle, where you take a, a sample of the tissue from the donor, and then you cultivate this tissue in a bioreactor part where the cells grow. And uh, you then, you, uh, when you have a mature tissue part, you reimplant it on the, on the patient. So the bioreactor part is the critical part uh, to enable you to generate structures that, uh, that allow you to fix the, the, bone, um, the bone defect. So our focus will uh, be on this bioreactor critical part where you need to generate the, the environment to enable cell growth and differentiation into a mature tissue before reimplantation in the patient. Uh, cell culture required conditions like uh, you can see on this, uh, on this table. Uh, they are a lot. You have to give the right temperature, nutrients, uh, culture vessel, a good osmotic pressure. You have to, to give growth factors, uh, control the pH, uh, also gas diffusion, cell waste removal. And also you can add mechanical simulation and electrical simulation to the bioreactor in order to allow cells to grow better and faster. But as you see, controlling so many parameters is very hard. And cell culture requires a complex multi-parameter control process that is capable of delivering this adequate cellular environment to promote cell growth and differentiation to the dry tissue. But also adding to this control problem, we, we have a, a difficulty that is small scale local properties like the environment surrounding the cell that is a very tiny uh, object. Like I say, it's not an object, but just a living being. Uh, it's hard or even impossible to measure. So, our solution, uh, let's say, uh, is to go to numerical models. Uh, and the numerical models also prove very helpful in many situations, like, for example, uh, in these big data problems like genomics, proteomics, clinical data. Uh, and they can help in uh, reaching these results, like better therapies, promoting well-being, saving costs, enabling prevention, and also a finer diagnosis. And they can be customized to, to the patient. So this is an, an healthcare 2.0. Saying that our proposal to the bioreactor combines two different parts. One that is a, a physical part. It's the, the bioreactor by himself, where we are designing it for digital manufacturing, for 3D printing. We are going for an open source uh, for science purposes. So this work can be uh, expandable and can be um, reachable to many groups around the world. Uh, it's a design that can be easy fa easily fabricated and customizable and with highly reproducible configurations. That can involve uh, a lot. But coupled to this physical part for 3D printing, we are also giving away uh, a virtual part that is a numerical digital twin. And this numerical dig this digital twin will allow us to do what, uh, what are the challenges that I was telling you about? That is to, how to, to control these many variables. And so the numerical model will contain electromagnetic, thermal, fluid dynamics models of the bioreactor 
And so they will allow, it, allow us to improve our understanding of the local conditions around each cell. And, uh, and when we have the physical uh, part of the reactor and the virtual part combined, we will also, on the bottom of this equation, improve control and experimental comparison and also replication conditions around the world uh, in researching for better tissue engineering um, properties and, and the solutions for the bone fracture problem. Uh, right now, in the past, this was our first, first work. Uh, it was published on polymers. Uh, this is our first reactor model. Uh, it's already 3D printer ready. It has a modular design. It's made of several small compartments that are, uh, that, that are fixed together by these screws. Um, it is a perfusion reactor that is a, also have a, a couple of electric stimulation device but also it can perform mechanical stimulation at the same time by fluid flow, uh, by the wall shear stress of the fluid flow. But uh, this is the physical part. And so how can the numerical methods help this bioreactor technology? And uh, we are thinking about three ways that they can help us to understand better what is happening with the cells and how can we generate this uh, environment for better cellular growth. Um, the first part is that FEM models uh, are able to predict the local environment cell culture conditions for different input conditions of the, our bioreactor. So uh, this is, uh, we are working with ComSol multiphysics. Uh, this is the, the partial differential equations available. So for electric currents, physics model, we are using conservation currents and then rotational condition and Ohm's law. And for fluid dynamics, uh, namely the laminar flow, fluid dynamics, we are using the continuity equation, the Navier-Stokes equations, and the total energy equation for a non-Newtonian fluid. Uh, the results can I show you for the same reactor that I, that I have shown you before, it's that uh, we can see the condition, the, in the, the region of interest is this small uh, rectangle on the middle. So we can uh, clearly see how, how, this, how is the environment around the cells. Uh, and we can see to the scale that uh, we are not able to measure it. So this is a very good uh, predictive result. Um, also, we can see the for electric currents physical model, model where we can see the electric field that we are giving to the cells. And in the fluid dynamics uh, physics model, we can see the pressure and the velocity uh, of the fluid that uh, is the wall shear stress stimulation that we are also giving to the cells. Another way that uh, FAM models can help us, finite element model can auxiliate system design in order to achieve specific cellular environments. So if we have a required shear stress or a required fluid flow distribution, we can change design like we are doing here on uh, this ABC condition where we change the design of the inlet to obtain on the region of interest different patterns of uh, fluid flow. So we, in, this, in this example that I'm giving to you in another work, we just uh, changed the design of the inlets to try to find uh, an osteogenic range. Osteogenic means that uh, differentiates the cells into bone, into bone tissue. So the range from some studies, uh, they say that uh, from 0 0.11 to 60 uh, millipascal you, of wall shear stress, you have a differentiation to bone. And so we kind of uh, get the, the, our region of interest where we culture the cells into that range. Uh, that was possible, that was possible with C condition. I'm not saying here that, but uh, I'm telling you that C condition was the best one. It uses less, less fluid and also uh, allow us to get into that uh, oxygenic range. Uh, this, Trying different combinations also do two great things in tissue engineering. The first is saving time. The second is uh, saving a lot of operational costs because everything is very expensive uh, in tissue engineering part. Another way that, uh, that uh, uh, numerical models can help us is uh, by, by, by considering scenarios after cell seeding. So, uh, it's in predicting cellular behavior, uh, where after predicting the local cellular environment, like how we are doing before, 
local conditions of fluid flow, local conditions of electric field, um, in the macro scale and on the micro scale, a different set of equations to model the cellular growth can be applied, trying also to predict the cellular behavior from these conditions. In this work that uh, is from colleagues, uh, a numerical optimization of cell um, colonization is done inside a perfusion bioreactor like, like we have. And so they have a micro scale model and, the, and a macro scale model, and they combine the two and then run these two laws that we see here, the, the evolution of concentration of dioxygen, very important. Uh, it's a nutrient that we need to give to the cells, dioxygen. So another, the evolution of cell density, also very critical because when we have the structures to cell seeding that are uh, too big, sometimes cells on the middle die because nutrients does, don't reach there. So this is uh, very important to, to know and this is a, a future step for us. Also, sorry, sorry moment. Also telling you what, uh, what are you doing? What is your plan for the future? So right now we are working on the, on the empty chamber of the bioreactor. We are starting adding the scaffold, which is a structure that supports cell seeding in the, in the region of interest. And in the, in the next step, we'll add the cells to the simulation, like uh, we are showing from other groups. So this is a, the complexity of the simulation is increasing a lot, and we are on the second step of this. The, another take home message that I, I wanna leave to you, is that bioreactor design uh, will greatly improve if it comes in the, in the middle of these three areas. So bioreactor numerical models that we are developing, it's very good to understand the local conditions around the cells, but then we need uh, better experimental results and also better cellular models to understand how this environment will, uh, will improve or, or, or not the, the cellular growth and the, the cell differentiation into a mature tissue. Could be bone, could be cardiac tissue, muscle tissue, uh, or any other tissue. But then um, another block that is very important in the future will be to use artificial intelligence or machine learning because this is a big data problem with many parameters. Uh, you can change, change a lot. Uh, and these, these are too complex for our understanding in simple rules. We have to search for patterns and these patterns can be unblocked by these technologies. Uh, by last, uh, I want to say that uh, this is only possible if you have a very uh, good multidisciplinary team. And so we are working uh, with mathematicians, physics, biology, mechanics, biomedical engineers. Uh, and uh, this is only possible if we work together in a combined way. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, the Foundation for Science and Technology for their support in multiple projects and uh, also for uh, your organization to invite me to speak here. So I will be available uh, for questions if you have some. Thank you. Thank you, Joel, for, for uh, your interesting presentation. Um, I, we are now open for questions. Hi, I have one question. Is it okay? Yes, of course. Okay. So, yeah. João, congratulations for your work. Um, I, uh, you said um, you plan to use uh, data mining, big data uh, methods to analyze the data. So, do you have an um, idea about the size of your data? How many features and how many examples do you have? Uh, I, I know it's too big, but I don't know <laughs> what is its size. I, I can show you uh, on this slide. For example, I, I can, I, this is just a small sample of the parameters that are involved because, uh, for example, culture media have uh, 40 uh, chemical species in different concentrations, for example. And, and I am told, and you have to add temperature, uh, vessel properties, osmotic pressure, gas diffusion, waste removal. Cells produce a different, uh, many kinds of chemical species also. Uh, 
when I talk in a big data problem, it's to control every single parameter of cell culture, and they are a lot. Uh, and, and we don't have models uh, for many of them. I will say the majority of them. So this, this is a huge challenge for the future, but if you want to uh, advance in, um, in cell growth, and cell differentiation, uh, we have to understand how these many chemical species come together in the differentiation because right now uh, they don't have, uh, we don't have uh, much conclusions about it. And uh, sometimes you just change a small thing and you get a different set of results, completely different from the ones that you are expecting in cell culture. So uh, this is a control problem, uh, many variables, many concentrations possible, uh, temperature also a problem, uh, and we are adding uh, stimulation to it, uh, not getting to the what is the optimal optimal stimulation to to add to the cells. They, we are not finding it because this is you can change, for example, chemical and do the same electrical part, and electrical it turns out a different set of results. I think I, I think I was clear, but. Uh, uh, okay, it. because I, I thought you were working at the level of simulation, so we have to have the models and properties and so to construct the, the, the to do the simulation okay. and we if, if we want to to, um, to do data mining, we have to have uh, the data sets. So are you also uh, simulating or making experimental um, uh, I changes and collecting the data is that no, right? No, no, no. Right now we no. are doing predictions of uh, stimulation. So we started by okay. electrical stimulation and then going to fluid flow, just by reactor conditions, the macroscopic ones. Uh, but uh, we have partners doing the part, the in vitro part, and uh, we are we will take in the future uh, a range of uh, of data from there. So this is a future step, not, not exactly, we, yet we are just making predictions. From yes, this is a beautiful project. Uh, I'm sure it will be very nice to look at this data and to see uh, what patterns you can extract you. from it. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne. Um, yeah, we are uh, now uh, introducing uh, this optimization in electrical, uh, mechanical and uh, uh, magnetic stimulation into these uh, tissue regeneration uh, problems and challenges and uh, we are validating our uh, numerical models uh, with our partners in uh, Instituto Superior Técnico in Portugal and um, ICBAS in Porto, University of Porto uh, in in vivo uh, for in vivo, in vivo validation. And so uh, we are working on that step uh, now. Future, future um, work will, will pass through that. And so we might talk uh, uh, whenever it, uh, it comes that time. And uh, if you're interested to collaborate, we are glad to, 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 to discuss this with you, okay? Thank you. This resembles our project of biomechanics because we construct, we, we look for patterns uh, through uh, real uh, experimental data from, uh, we are trying the vis viscoelastic materials. So we collect the data and construct the model. So this, so uh, it's very interesting. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you, Wayne. Sorry, we need to move on now. We can talk a little bit later uh, to our the main speaker of uh, uh, our session, uh, Professor Remco Dutz. Uh, thank you, uh, Remco, for joining us. Let me briefly introduce uh, old work you have done. Uh, so uh, Remco uh, received his uh, master's degree in mathematics in 2001 at Eindhoven uh, University of Technology, the Netherlands. He received his PhD in biomedical engineering also at the uh, University of Technology uh, University in the Netherlands. His research interests sub subtend uh, lead group theory, geometric deep learning, differential geometry, harmonic analy analysis, PDE's harmonic analysis, uh, 
uh, yes, harmonic <laughs> analysis, uh, geometric control, machine learning, and their applications to biomedical imaging and vision. He has more than 100 publications, including a wide spectrum of journal publications, books, uh, books, uh, chapters, and peer-reviewed conference proceedings, ranging from applied medical imaging processing to mathematical image analysis to, to mathematics, differential geometry, geometric control, harmonic analysis. He has received an ERC starting grant from 2014 to 2019 entitled Lee Group Analysis for Medical Image, Image Processing from the European Research Council and a prestigious NWO Vichy from 2021 to 2026 entitled Geometric Learning for Image Analysis from the Dutch Foundation of, of Scientific Research where both uh, our personal grants. He is program uh, program committee member of biannual uh, congress such as geometric science of information, scale space and variational methods, and broad member of the scale space and variational methods. He is an editor for the journal of mathematical imaging vision and vision, where he has led a special issue on differential geometry and multi orientation analysis in imaging processing in two thousand eighteen. International long-term visits include different universities, Brown University, Sarland University, Link Hopkins University, and Institute Henri Poincaré Paris, where he, has visiting, uh, he was visiting professor during the spring of 2019. He received several awards, include five best uh, paper awards, nine selected papers, one best po poster award, a Philips Impact Award, and a best reviewer award at Scale, Space, and Variational Method that's in 2015. You organize many large workshops and many congress on themes such as mathematics for deep learning and geometric control and imaging processing. Thank you once again, Remco, for taking time for, from your busy, very busy agenda to share with us the amazing applications of uh, mathematics in health uh, regarding the new invariant deep learning via PDEs and medical imaging analysis applications. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you, uh, Paula, for this very uh, and kind introduction. Um, so I will now share my screen and uh, start the presentation. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, uh, before I start, I will uh, thank the organizers for uh, organizing such a wonderful congress and also this uh, very nice session. Uh, so, thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, present my work here. So, I will present uh, equivariant deep learning uh, via PDEs, and this is a uh, joint work with uh, my PC student uh, Bart Smets, uh, former postdoc Eric Beckers, and Jim Portugies from uh, the Eindhoven University of Technology. Okay. Medical images often contain complex line structures, such as blood vessels and fibers. And detection and tracking of these line structures is challenging, as medical images are noisy and interrupted lines can be disastrous for the overall medical intervention. Moreover, such complex line structures may exhibit crossings and bifurcations, where current methods often fail in the sense that they miss line, segment, miss line segments or wrongly connect them. So this requires extremely costly user input to correct. And this hampers clinical usage because we need computer-aided diagnosis tools that are fully automatic, correct, fast, and easy to use. So let us consider a simple example, where a cardiologist wants to follow a coronary artery in a 2D X-ray image. The cardiologist clicks at the yellow dot, and then the state-of-the-art tracker takes the wrong exit in the red circle. Well, imagine the cardiologist having to navigate his catheter based on this wrong track. This can be disastrous, of course. So we automatically, to overcome these problems, we automatically lift the image to the higher dimensional space of positions and organizations and orientations to resolve all crossings and the tracker thereby provides the correct output. And this 
basic example generalizes to geometric data processing in general. And the urgent need for automation with less training data to deal with more complex geometric structure motivates geometric learning via partial differential equations. A key aspect, and this is throughout the whole presentation, is that we lift images from position space only to the higher dimensional homogeneous space of positions and orientations before we apply processing via so-called orientation scores. And this allows one to deal with crossings and bifurcations. Keep in mind that on these lifted image representations on position and orientation space, the vertical axis encodes orientation. Okay, so in our approach, we merge differential geometry and machine learning. And here we aim to overcome the handcrafting in geometric image analysis and the terrible lack of geometric interpretation in deep learning. And therefore we integrate the good part of geometric image analysis and the good part of deep learning based image processing in such a way that only the green pluses apply. So then we have a high performance, a wide scope, automation and interpretable results with small computational loads and high reduction of both network parameters and costly training data. So I propose PDE based convolutional neural networks and it enables us to include geometry in convolutional neural networks, CNNs where we reduce the network by employing symmetries. So for example, on the image on the left, uh, we see an image of an apple. If I rotate, translate, or scale this image of an apple, it's still the image of an apple, and it should be classified as an apple. To learn the geometry, we apply by the PDEs, uh, training and linear non-linear non convolutions solving PDs on the high dimensional homogeneous space of positions and orientations to improve classification, such as automatic vessel segmentation as depicted on the right. So let us consider convolutional neural networks, where given the training data, one minimizes a loss function via standard stochastic gradient descent. And so given a training set consisting of inputs xi and desired outputs yi, find a function phi uh, omega, the network parameterized by omega that best maps each input to a desired output. And then you do this uh, uh, minimization of this loss via a standard stochastic gradient descent. Well, there are many applications of convolutional neural networks in medical imaging, such as the automatic segmentation of blood vessels and detection of mitosis in histopathology images. And this is important for the prognostication of cancer. Now you see the example of the prognostication of cancer in histopathology images, uh, where we had to detect uh, a mitosis uh, at the bottom of the slide. Well, there's a lot of research going on on equivalent group, group convolutional neural networks. So instead of normal convolutional networks, we're now going to make the step to group convolutional networks. And in particular, in the machine learning lab of uh, Max Welling at UVA in Amsterdam, uh, where uh, in, yeah, I mean, the computer science approach, approaches provide interesting problems to mathematicians. And there are three works I would like to address in particular. The rigid body motion scattering by Stefan Balat and Siffler, who built it up on um, orientation score theory equivalences and um, um, uh, basically, I was also the, in the PhD committee of, uh, of Laurent Siffre, who is currently the director of Google DeepMind, applying such uh, uh, techniques in deep learning. And then both uh, Cohen and Welling, and uh, Becker, uh, Eric Beckers and myself, brought this to deep learning with more uh, effective nonlinearities than the modelers in scattering. And finally, there's interesting work by Finzi et al. on probabilistic convolutional neural networks that are effective and that benefit from the PDE description of the work that I will present. Okay, so what does this mean, equivariant convolutional networks? Well, equivariance means that a symmetry group action on the input corresponds to the same group action on the output. For example, rotating and translating input amounts to the same roto translation of the output. 
And to distinguish between the group action and the homogeneous space on which it acts, we write G for the group elements and P for the homogeneous space elements. And we shall denote the action explicitly by the O dot symbol in the rectangle. As we lift images to higher dimensional homogeneous spaces, we have to account for this, uh, this group structure. For example, to, if we uh, lift the images to orientation scores on the homogeneous space of positions and orientations. And in this slide, we show how such actions, such group actions work on the orientation scores via shift twist actions. So you see here on the left, uh, a roto and translation of, a, of an image. And then this is a corresponding shift twist, a group action on the lifted image representation. You see this shift twist transform popping up naturally from the semi-direct product of the Euclidean Marshall group. Now, with these actions, we can create group correlation layers, which are also group convolution layers when they're reflecting the kernel. So now we can do group convolutions on these lifted image representations. And here you see the effect of such a group convolution. And of course we need equivariance. And indeed, if I rotate and translate the image, uh, the corresponding lifted image and also the processed lifted image uh, rotates and translate accordingly. It's very important. We applied this extension from convolutional networks to group convolutional networks to equivariant convolutional networks and many medical imaging tasks. Uh, I already mentioned the histopathology uh, where we did uh, the detection of mitotic fixture figures in the histopathology slides. It's important for the, also for the uh, monitoring the, the uh, progression of cancer. Uh, then uh, in this middle image, you see the segmentation of 2D blood vessels. Uh, and then in the third, you see cell boundary segmentation electron, electron microscopy images. And to ensure a fair comparison between the networks and the discretizations of SA2, uh, because we had uh, orientations, so uh, which were in, indicated with n, the number of discretized orientations, we match the total number of free parameters in each network. And each time we outperform 2D networks that do rely on data augmentation by rotations. Uh, the normal CNNs don't have the rotation equivalence, so we have to take all the training data, the label training data, rotate that, and do data augmentation. And this is basically um, consuming a lot of network complexity that you actually would like to use for uh, training uh, relevant structures in the, in the images. Now, as you can see, the, typically with eight orientations, we get the best results. And our GCNNs do not waste this valuable network capacity on having to learn how to deal with geometric transformations because they are inherently encoded in the network structure. So the SE2 GCNNs do not require data augmentation by rotations and the SE2 GCNNs outperform the 2D networks because of the geometric design. And this uh, yielded a um, Phillips Impact Award uh, and uh, an award at the Mackay uh, Congress. But okay, this was the first step to include equivariances in convolutional networks, also rotation and translation equivariance. But now we consider PDE-based partial differential equation-based convolutional group convolutional networks. So let's have a look on how such a PDE GCNN, where G stands for equivariance and PDE for PDE-based uh, equivariant networks, how that is built. Well, in the first layer, we left the image data towards an orientation score. This is done by a family of, uh, of uh, oriented wavelets that you can either train or uh, design geometrically. And the first layer, the training is not so important, but in the subsequent layers, you need to really train the, the, uh, the data and, um, and the processing. And then we apply multiple PDE layers where each layer is an operator splitting of a PDE, a partial differential equation, evolution involving convection of, uh, for transport and offsets, diffusion for some regularization, and dilation and erosion for max and min pooling over uh, Riemannian balls. And then we apply a projection layer at the end to basically map all the results back to the image domain. So from the lifted space of positions and orientations back to the normal position space where the image was given. Okay, so we set up this theory in a very general homogeneous setting. And even the current translation invariant CNNs are just a special case of our uh, PDE GCNNs. So ordinary CNNs have kernels, say, on a 5 by 5 grid that are a superposition of multiple offsets kernels carrying a sampling resolution 
and one applies, say, max pulling over squares. Well, you could have well taken a max pulling over balls, uh, normal balls uh, with respect to the L2 norm, but okay, uh, if you do uh, the, the, the um, L infinity norm, then you would end up with this. Now, in our PDE GCNNs, we extend the image domain by lifting the data to the high dimensional space of positions and orientations with a group structure on the lifting layer. And in the PDE layers, we essentially apply the same steps. Only now we take advantage of the equivariance and geometric design and reduction in the high dimensional homogeneous space of positions and orientations. And we implement these PDEs solely via linear and nonlinear morphological convolutions that we will explain on the next slide. So the math. We make linear combinations of PDE evolutions with stopping time t. The choice of the stopping time can as well be set equal to one in view of a scaling invariance action of, uh, of the scale space theory that underlies these PDEs. Now, by the dunford petters theorem, nearly every linear operator is a kernel operator and by equivariance, we end up with linear convolutions on homogeneous space. The linear part of the PDEs is therefore solved by such a linear convolution with an exact Wiens function that one can compute. I will approximate that in the next slide. The nonlinear part is quasi-linear. Yeah, because you also in the red part is a nonlinear PDE, but it's quasi-linear, meaning that it would be linear if the times plus algebra would be replaced by the plus max algebra. And the only equivariant quasi-linear operators are morphological group convolutions. So these hamilton jacobi bellman equations are still solved by a lux olenaic formula which is uh, a convolution over a different algebra. Okay, so let's consider the case where the homogeneous space is R2. We see how transport takes care of offsets, fractional diffusion for small amounts of smoothing, max pooling enlarges the structures, min pooling sharpens the structures, and we plot both the kernels yeah, on, the, uh, on the one but final row, and what these kernels do when implementing them or applying them on an image of an A, just to give you some intuition, of the smoothing, extension, and sharpening. Well, we do the same thing on this higher dimensional space of positions and orientations, and then the structures are because of this torqued uh, uh, geometry that you have on the, on the position orientation space modeled by the Cartan connection. And then you see that uh, essentially you can still uh, uh, move things around in this uh, uh, position orientation space. You can still diffuse automatically in this uh, space of positions and orientations. You can still group elements in the space of positions and orientations. And you can basically uh, sharpen things. Okay. So when you look at an image as a human, you will automatically connect local line segments. If you look at this image after a while, you will see, hey, there is a contour hidden. What happens is that you have a local orientation selective cells in your visual cortex that make an orientation score of an image. And this has been tested with voltage, voltage sensitive dye on mammals, brains, like the tree shoe. And Hubble and Wiesel, they received a Nobel Prize for it. So in our own human visual system, in the primary visual cortex, we have these orientation selective cells. And here you see the little guy from Ice Age and with the voltage sensitive dye, you see, hey, this is the part of the cortex where you have the orientation selective cells. And it turns out that we encode all orientations per position, like also we do in the mathematical model. Well, let's have a look. If you look after a while, you will see that you're, you tend to fill in this contour. And you see, you check for alignment with these line elements and then you connect them. Now, it turns out that we have so-called association fields on how to connect these local lines. And uh, Jean Petitot discovered the underlying subgramon and geometry that uh, underlies this, uh, this, uh, this process. But keep in mind, you do this association fields in this higher dimensional space of positions and orientations, like in your own visual cortex. Here we plot the Riemannian balls that support these association fields. So the shapes look a bit twisted when you go to the position orientation space. Uh, um, but when you project it down on the, on the image domain, it's very natural propagations of local line segments. And we can include curvature, uh, as you can see here. And yeah, this is uh, similar to our own visual system. And then we... Uh, we can, uh, we can uh, train these, uh, these uh, geometric neurons in the, 
in the in the PDE GCNN. So we train on this position orientation space. Now interest. I believe our speaker has some internet problems. <laughs> Wait a little bit. Yes. Let's see. Okay. Okay. No, let's again. Go. No. No. Okay. Now. No, it's okay. Can you it's hear? okay now. Thank you. No. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Um, I hope that it stays stable. I don't know what it is with the internet today. Normally, I don't have problems with that, but today is a real mess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so let us have a look. Uh, I was talking about these rectifying linear units in convolutional networks. They spoil the mathematical analysis. And I just cut them from the, from the networks because you can prove that these morphological convolutions and these nonlinear PDEs, they can replace them. They are special cases and actually non-optimal cases. So we train, instead of doing a, a re rectifying linear units, Max pulling of Riemannian balls in this homogeneous space of positions and orientations, modeling these association fields. Okay, and we have some theorem on that that shows that you can cut these uh, rectifying linear unit. And this is important because central limit theorems for linear processes allow to get some mathematical grasps on, on, uh, on, uh, on convolutional networks, the linear part, but also for the nonlinear part via the Kramer transform. But it's details that I don't want to enter now. But at least mathematically, now we can analyze the overall dynamics, but also design the local dynamics. And then we do max pulling over these balls in position orientation space. And here you see some, uh, some for different parameter settings, uh, how these balls look like. But of course you train these things from the training data. So the training data tells us what the right balls are for to do the, the, the max pulling. And then you see that also in computer science, people are basically in probabilistic convolutional networks. People are doing this, but with the constraints on it. So there is no interaction between the layers and especially to have interaction between the layers on position orientation space, you get a lot of benefit and better results from that. Okay, now uh, let's solve the PDE via quick, quick and efficient analytic kernel approximations. And then we have the following result. We have hamilton jacob bellman equations and you can, um, can uh, the, the, the Green's functions of these, uh, of these uh, you have lax Olenaic formulas for these, uh, for these hamilton jacob bellman equations. And then we can uh, approximate, uh, uh, then we get the computer viscosity solutions and they are then found by uh, soft max pulling over Riemannian balls on the position space and orientation space. And then we have quick analytic approximations. And as you can see on the right column, these quick analytic approximations via the Lie algebra, uh, just simple formulas, uh, like uh, just some sines and cosines and, 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 and things that you can sample very quickly on the GPU. I mean, it's well enough to, to the exact solution that we also studied. Okay, uh, let's have a look. So this was for the nonlinear part, the max pooling over Riemannian balls. Then I'll be brief on the linear part. For the linear part, on position orientation space, you can do linear diffusions. And so this is linear diffusions on this homogeneous space of positions and orientations. And this was uh, some open problem to find the Green's functions on these uh, PDEs on the, the space of positions and orientations. So instead of <laughs> averages of random walks, you have averages of random drives and random flights. And I computed these uh, these uh, these. Um, uh, Green's functions for the first time exactly with some harmonic analysis techniques. But the problem is these exact solutions are too uh, expensive to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to because they involve uh, some Fourier transform techniques um, and they are too expensive to feed to the GPU. But again, it's nice we have some quick analytic approximations that are good enough in practice. So then we use these quick analytic approximations. I'll skip the mathematical details here a bit. Uh, you may have heard about uh, Gaussian approximations of heat kernels on manifolds, and uh, especially on Lie groups, this gets uh, uh, quite nice. And then you can uh, transfer this theory from, uh, from the diffusion system also to the, to the, the fractional diffusion systems, and you get some, uh, some nice formulas and some, uh, some mathematical underpinning of how good these approximations, these analytic approximations to the PDEs are. Okay, so how does this go in total? Uh, to summarize a bit, image goes in, we lift the image, we apply PDE uh, layers, 
the operator splitting of the PDE gives us linear and morphological convolutions, no rectifying linear units because we don't need them, and then we project back to the image domain. Have in this case here to do vessel uh, segmentation. And the only thing that is involved is just linear convolutions and these non-linear, quasi-linear uh, convolutions implementing these Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equations. And we have good quick analytic approximations that we can feed to the GPU. And then we uh, uh, made uh, GPU algorithms for, uh, for this. So that's uh, uh, actually uh, still relatively fast. Um, so here we did some results um, uh, to show that this really is uh, uh, helping in applications. And with GCNNs, we improved convolutional neural networks, but the PDE GCNNs greatly improved the GCNNs. So, uh, and, and this second step is what they're now publishing and things are, are working out well here. So uh, what you can see here, if you compare to a normal CNN, you see something like uh, uh, if we do six layers, huh? so for basic, forward networks. So suppose you use 50,000 parameters for a normal convolutional network. We can get better results with only 4,000 parameters. Or if we go deeper, huh, and it's, I mean, it gets better and better when the, the more deeper layers you introduce. For example, with a normal CNN, if you would apply 130,000 parameters, uh, you can see that we can do only with 3,500 uh, parameters, with still better results. So we have a, a massive reduction of network parameters and still better results on the application yeah, because you can uh, uh, basically check you have label data you can check you you you, you train your network and then you test your that network uh, on the on the different data and then uh, and then uh, you can uh, see these results so the good thing here is that and that's a special to a special thanks to my pc and bart smets who made a very good uh, gpu implementation that we don't, uh, although this is mathematically uh, quite high level compared to convolutional neural networks, we don't, we, we are not so much slower than the, what, what the NVIDIA uh, uh, engineers uh, designed for normal convolutional networks. Uh, and then with our own research code, we're still quite close in testing and uh, training time. It's a bit uh, more than a normal convolutional network, but again, better than the, the, the the, 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 the GCNNs that, that were awarded by Philips. So this is now a, a new step where we can reduce an enormous amount of network parameters and still have better results. And that's all thanks to quick analytic approximations of these PDEs that we underpin with several theorems, as you can see that I uh, uh, showed before that they are good enough in practice. This applies to medical image processing applications, but we also checked it on, on, on various other applications. So for example, the MS Trot, this is a digit, uh, um, a digit classification task. Uh, and then uh, you can see that also on this MS Trot, if you look at the standard uh, 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 basic network, uh, because uh, we don't want to compare with, 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 with uh, uh, difficult architectures, because then it's always the question, is it the architecture that made the difference? Or is it uh, basically, the, the, if you want to come up with a new model, you want to check it first on basic, uh, basic uh, feed forward networks. And then we had, uh, if we compare, for example, to uh, the, the approach by Lynette, then you see that uh, we have a, a much higher accuracy, 99% um, uh, 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 accuracy with uh, 20, a, fa a reduction factor of 20 on the amount of parameters, as you can see on bold face. Yeah? And you can see that uh, uh, in view of uh, uh, test time and, uh, and, and uh, epoch times, and uh, the number of epochs, you see that we do a very good job there uh, with the PDE GCNNs. And also, I mean, much less parameters, uh, only a slight increase of, of computational load, and, um, and uh, yeah, a much uh, higher performance. Okay, so a conclusion. Uh, we see that uh, uh, over here we see that that the PDE GCNNs improve the GCNNs uh, that improve the CNNs. So equivalent convolutional networks are better than convolutional networks, and the PDE-based 
equivariant convolutional networks are even better than the, the, the equivariant convolutional networks. The PDE group convolutional networks use PDE layers with analytic, linear, and morphological kernels supported by three theorems. And then, yeah, the implementation is just you lift the image, you apply linear and morphological convolutions on this homogeneous space. And then at the end, you project back and you have the improved uh, uh, classification tasks. Okay, so this work um, uh, I've published at the Scale Space and Variational Methods uh, Conference. Uh, and we got an invitation for a special issue for GMIV. We just submitted uh, our paper. And uh, if you're interested uh, in the paper, uh, you can have a look at the, at the link, but also uh, at the slides on the bottom, I, I put some references. And uh, what's also interesting, if you would be interested in equivariant uh, uh, deep learning, uh, this is uh, all the code is publicly available and uh, distributed to the standard framework of PyTorch with Demito, uh, uh, demos and the Jupyter notebooks so that you can actually use this technique yourself. And you can always use it whenever you want to do a, a, a deep learning network in such a way that if your input data rotates, the output or the classification tasks should rotate accordingly. And this ends the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Remco, for uh, such a, an inspired and fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, it is uh, very interesting to, to see the high quality and uh, cutting edge uh, research that uh, um, a person running his uh, training from mathematics and biomedical engineering can uh, conduct. And congratulations once again for, uh, for your, this amazing work. Um, uh, we are now open for, for questions. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Mm -hmm. Remember that you have to write. There is a question now. Uh, Milton um, asked for thank you very much for your nice presentation. I'm interested to know more about the convection, the diffusion. I don't know if you can read also. Uh, Let's have a look here at the QA. Okay, so I have to now go to the chat. Yeah. Exactly. No, no, question and answers. Question and answers. Oh, to the Q&A. Okay, yeah. The Q&A, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay, I see it. I'm interested to know more about the convection, the diffusion, and the relation erosion model and relate to the geometric structures that you want to extract. Okay, yes. Um, um, so the convection. So maybe I should go back to slide... Um, uh, can you still see my screen? Or do yes. Have to? Yeah, okay. yes. Yeah. So I think here, if you look at the normal convolutional network, you have like for your kernels, you can see that as a superposition of offsets, <laughs> offset kernels, and a certain resolution for uh, the scale that uh, each pixel uh, represents, and then you have the max polling. And now by replacing this manifold of position space to the homogeneous space of position orientation space, you have a similar thing. And then in the Lie group, when you do a convection, convection always goes along the exponential curves in the Lie group. And so if you go from the exponent from the Lie algebra to the, to the Lie group, mm -hmm. and these are the, say, the straight curves, uh, the straight curves in the in the in the in, in the torque geometry of, of, of the Lie group when you put the Cartan connection, they are the outer parallel curves. So these are the straight line curves, and these are circular spirals in the SE2 case. And uh, what you do basically is that you transport your data. Uh, for example, here you see some uh, uh, some transport. You transport your data along the circle of spirals <laughs> in the position orientation space data. And um, so that is for the transport part. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying in, in, in R2, you would transport by doing a shift vector, but that's an exponential curve in the, in the, Lie, uh, in the, in the Lie group. I mean, <laughs> consider R2 as a, a Lie group and you have the exponential map, takes the tangent vector at the origin, you go via a straight line. But now the straight lines are circular spirals. And then the whole motion goes along these circular spirals. And then you see what happens to the data 
if I start off, say, with a volume in position orientation space, you follow these, and you can include curvature in, 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 in your transport. So you account for that. Um, so the, this is how the transport is done. Uh, transport in league groups means that you uh, solve this, uh, say, a transport advection equation. And um, if you, uh, for example, in the linear um, PDEs, then you know uh, with transport equation, advection equation, it's method of characteristics, and then you transport your data along your characteristics. But in this case, uh, uh, the characteristics are the exponential curves in the Lie group. Uh, so that's for the transport part. The regularization is done by uh, a group convolution. Uh, actually, the convection is also a group convolution, but then with a singular kernel. But, uh, the group convolutions are formulas are down here. Just like normal heat diffusion is solved uh, on R2 with a convolution with a Gaussian kernel, you still have a convolution, but now on the shift twist convolution. Uh, on, this, uh, on this data, you can see uh, in the, the middle of the slide 17 here, you can see that, uh, they say, uh, the convolution with the Gaussian kernel, you have x minus y. <laughs> well, uh, um, uh, you see now that, uh, that uh, you have this action of the group on the, on the homogeneous space P, x minus y is like <laughs> x inverse times y. <laughs> and, um, and you have basically the, 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 the u, uh, so you just replace the product on R2 that you know for implementing diffusion uh, by the, 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 the product on the, on, the, on the group of roto translations. And that's a shift twist transform with a diffusion kernel. And yeah, I mean, this is like, uh, as you know that a normal diffusion kernel, uh, you get that by uh, random walks. You, you just count the amount of number of, 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 of drunk men ending up at your square. <laughs> you get a Gaussian kernel. Similar holds for position orientation space with drunk men drives. <laughs> and then you uh, get uh, basically these, uh, these sheet kernels. So, but the most important thing for the, getting the good results in practice, okay, the convection is important, but the diffusion is less important. The, 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 the most important thing are the dilations and the erosions, the max pulling over Riemannian balls. Um, and that is implemented by a morphological convolution. So that's implemented like here. So what is a morphological convolution? It's like a linear convolution. Linear convolution is kernel, shift the kernel, multiply with your data, do the sum. And I just replace the max, uh, sorry, the times plus algebra by the plus max algebra. So instead of multiplying the functions, I add them. Instead of integrating at the end, I do not sum, but I just take the, 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 the maximum. So by changing this algebra, in a way, these solutions are still linear, but yeah, not linear in the classical sense, but you have to change your algebra. And then if you do that, then uh, such a linear convolution becomes a morphological convolution. And the good thing is that from PDE theory, if you look in the book of Evans for hamilton jacobi bellman equations, then uh, lax Olenaic formulas for solving hamilton jacobi bellman equations are such morphological convolutions. They are, <laughs> uh, you take a minimum, an infimal convolution, and instead of a, 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 a times, you have a plus. And um, yeah, does this answer the question a bit, how these things are implemented? Because the implementations are basically the two lines of, of, of 17. Yeah, and for the, I have to say for the convection, we apply, um, we could have done the top uh, formula in slide 17, but for the convection, we do interpolation standard because we have, we move and then we do standard interpolation techniques, but it actually also boils down to, uh, because of the equivalence to a linear convolution, but, uh, um, but so. Um, professor uh, Milton, uh, Professor Milton has answer again in chat. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, um, and he has another question. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Good. And what is the Lie group used? Yeah. Uh, the Lie group is the Lie group of roto translations. So uh, that's SE2. It's a semi direct product of R2. And I think I had a few slides. Uh, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, here it is. 
So this is the group of, it's a semi-direct product of the translation group and the rotation group. Very important for visual perception of models is that you have the semi-direct product. Uh, so you have the, the answer to the question is the roto translation group. So you have positions and rotations acting on the space of positions and orientations uh, via this action. But if you are in uh, two dimensions and orientations and rotations can be identified, 3D is a little, uh, <laughs> you need to mod out a uh, stabilizer, but okay. Um, um, so the answer is the, this, this group of roto translations. And why is our roto translation so important also in the perception of contours? If I would just act, if I would put a direct product structure and to say do a, a standard uh, metric on R2, combine it with uh, a standard metric on SOD, uh, uh, with SOD and have no interaction, then for example, if I would take a distance, these two things are nicely aligned. Yeah? But if I would do just say a standard, uh, let's say that we work on, uh, on R2 times S1, let's unfold the S1 and just say uh, R3. <laughs> yeah? And if we would do a Euclidean metric there, then this would be the same distance as this, because the angle is the same and the distance is the same. But this one is very well aligned and this one is not. So it's very important to impose a anisotropic Riemannian geometry on the space of positions and orientations. And these metric tensor fields are precisely the things that we train. So the parameters in our network are the convection parameters. The metric tensor fields for the Riemannian job. So we train the Riemannian geometry, the Riemannian balls on position orientation space. And these parameters C, G1, and, uh, and, and the parameters for the metric tensor field G1 and the metric tensor field G2, they enter the analytic approximations of the PDEs. So by by, by, by training these kernels, what we actually do is training these PDE coefficients. So instead of normal convolutional networks where you just train, um, uh, say, a matrices with hardly any meaning uh, just, uh, that, that you put everywhere, we now have, uh, we, 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 we train for the geometric uh, uh, PDE coefficients. Yes. Does this okay. answer your question a bit? Yeah, uh, I, uh, I suggest uh, uh, that uh, if uh, uh, Milton has uh, uh, more questions or the other uh, participants uh, can uh, contact directly each of the speakers uh, because we are running out of time now. Uh, thank you once again, Remco, for your uh, amazing presentation. Thank you all the speakers for their a fantastic presentation as well. We are very glad to have um, uh, organized this uh, this uh, session, um, and uh, and uh, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we uh, invite all the participants and speakers to join the the, the rest of the, the this national event that will continue throughout the, the week. Thank you once again. Uh, look forward to see you soon. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye. And uh, and uh, Conceição, no, don't know if you want to say something. But... No, I don't. No, just bye and thank you to everyone who participate as speaker or as uh, attending the the session. Okay.